So, I have a confession to make. I love trees, and I kill them. I've probably killed 10,000, tens of thousands of trees in the last decade, but that's not nearly as many as climate change-related causes have already killed. Things like insect and disease outbreaks and drought. So, I study conifers, and conifers are uh, ancient trees that ancient species that live on Earth um, cover huge areas, and they've been around for hundreds of millions of years. Now, they continue to provide us with a lot of things. They provide us with clean air, clean water, habitat for many species, and they also provide us with the wood and paper we use every day. Now, how have these species lived for so long on the face of the Earth? Well, the environment has always changed over time, and trees have had to deal with that. And they've dealt with this in two ways. They've had to migrate or adapt. Now, trees have had to migrate great distances, but this is a very slow process. After the last ice age, trees were able to migrate about 100 yards per year. But to keep up with the current rate of human-caused climate change, they would have to migrate several miles per year. Now, they can also adapt as some trees successfully uh, live and reproduce and others die, but that process of evolution through natural selection takes quite a while. So, the trees of any given species have different genetic blueprints depending on where they live, and that reflects the climates that they're adapted to. So, for example, these are Sitka spruces, and we collected seed from California to Alaska, and we planted those seeds all together in an experiment. And so the growth that you see here reflects largely their genetics, because they're the same age and they grew in the same environment. And you see huge differences among them. The trees from Alaska are tiny, but tough. They grow for only a very short period of time, because they're adapted to a short summer. The trees from California, they grow and grow, and they tower over their Alaska neighbors, uh, because they are adapted to a long uh, summer. Now, if you were to take a tree from California and plant it in Alaska, it wouldn't do any better than if you took a Californian dressed for California and put them in an Alaska winter. So these populations, they have home field advantage, just like a sports team. The, local, the locally adapted material has historically done best in that place. But as climates change, home field advantage no longer works. So how can we use this natural genetic diversity to help forests adapt to climate change? Well, we plant in the U.S. and in Canada over three billion trees every year. And people decide what to plant where. So if we can better understand this adaptation to climate, we can change what we plant where. So we study the characteristics of trees that help them deal with their climate. And you may not think of trees as growing very quickly, but these are lodgepole pine. And uh, if you watch them here, we measure their growth when they start growing, when they stop growing, how much they grow, and we relate that to the environments that they come from. But we also establish um, big experiments where we uh, torture them in various ways, we expose them to uh, heat waves, drought, freezing temperatures, and this work requires a lot of people power, particularly student power. It's very labor-intensive. But what if we could look directly at the genes that affect those traits and affect adaptation to climate? Well, conifers have obese genomes. They have about seven times as much DNA as ev in every cell as you or me. And the genes make up less than 1% of that DNA. So, can we go in and grab the genes and just sequence those? Now, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, this was impossible. But new genomic technologies allow us to grow, go in, pull out the genes, and sequence those. And then we can search for the ones that are related to climate. And through this process, we have generated enormous data sets. For example, we have sequenced over 4 trillion DNA letters 
in pines and in spruces from different locations across species ranges. And if we were to print that data out, we would have a stack of paper 200 times taller than the Empire State Building. So we don't print it. <laughs> But we do require supercomputing compu- super clusters to analyze the data. And what do we look for? Well, what we look for is patterns, patterns in the variation. We have identified millions of locations within those genomes that vary. Some individuals have one letter, some have another in those places. And what we do is we look at the traits related to climate. Uh, we look at the traits related to climate, we look at the climates themselves, and we lay those patterns together with the genes, and we look for those genes that affect adaptation to climate. And we can use that information to better choose trees to plant for new environments. We can also increase the genetic diversity and the species diversity of what we plant to add resilience to the system. So scientists are looking for solutions to slow the effects of climate change on natural biological systems. And genetic diversity plays a major role in that search. Thank you. Hello. So in January today, she retired. And Dylan, unfortunately, she has retired too. So I am in their, sort of in their place today. I have a quick question. In your studies, which t- species of trees was the most interesting? Yeah. Well, it's hard to have a favorite species. I work on about 10 of them. But the one that's probably closest to my heart is the white bark pine. And this is a species that only occurs at very high elevations. And the only way it disperses its seed is with a bird called the Clark's nutcracker. The other interesting thing about it is the seeds are a major food source for grizzly bears. So when those trees can't produce seed, the grizzlies don't do as well in places like Yellowstone. So it's a beautiful tree, it's in the mountains, and it has to be my favorite. All right, thank you. Thank you.